Hello and welcome to another Time for Time series. Today we're going to talk about a very interesting topic in time series analysis, and that's backtesting. Backtesting is a very important topic that uh, you will surely uh, get in contact with while talk, uh, tackling time series data. And today I'll show you how to do that properly uh, and how to do that uh, well with Tim. So um, in order to get started with um, backtesting, we of course need the time series data sets that we want to analyze. So let's start with this example. Now from here, uh, let's first start by describing uh, a prediction scenario. So we have here data in this example, it's hourly data, and we want to make some predictions a couple of hours ahead into the future, let's say the next day. Um, so we send this data through the modeling process of Tim. Uh, it then builds for us model and predictions, uh, and that gives us the following results. So we now have a set of uh, predictions that we want to, of course, um, validate if those are accurate predictions, uh, because we don't have any actual values yet ready to uh, compare these values against. So we'll have to wait until the next day for those values to become available before we can get an answer uh, of the quality of these predictions. So the next day you uh, do that exercise again, you generate another set of predictions and new actual values have been uh, measured. So you can put those now next to the yesterday's values and you can continue that process on and on. So now we can get a first question uh, answer to the question of how accurate my uh, predictions are. Unfortunately, going through this process, we always have to wait until the next uh, update for um, for validating the quality of my models of my predictions. And we of course need a process to uh, do that before we put something into production because we want to make sure that the predictions that are being generated and are going to be used in the rest of our processes uh, are of course of good quality. And for this, uh, we go through the process of backtesting. So what is uh, in a nutshell backtesting? It's a process for testing the performance of a predictive model. And you typically, at least in the context of time series, go to uh, these four steps to uh, get the answers that you are looking for. First of all, uh, you want to split your data into a training uh, and a testing set. So you make a cutoff at a certain date in the past and you'll um, split that training data up and that training data goes to the uh, model building process. So you build a model based only on training data. Um, then you take that model, you combine that with test data, and that generates for you predictions. Um, and those predictions can now be put next to uh, observed values, which we already have available because we're backtesting, um, but we're not used in the model building process. So that simulates a, um, a real production scenario and uh, allows us to validate the quality of our model of our predictions and see if there's any useful predictive value within the data um, present. So that's uh, the four steps that you go through. So what does that look like in action? Well, first, splitting your data uh, into training and testing data might uh, be seem very straightforward, but actually there's a lot more to it than you might think, um, simply because we are working with time series data. In any other type of data set, such as uh, image recognitions, et cetera, other um, AI models working to uh, analyze specific types of data, then you would simply shuffle the data and um, take a random subset to build your model on. However, here we have a chronicle, chronological order in the data. So you don't want to provide the training, uh, the model, let's say, with information it shouldn't have available. So we always need to take a first part of the data set for training and um, I call that in sample and a larger part for testing. Now you can still uh, have a choice in, of course, how much data you include. And that's also a very important question to ask, something I will go deeper into um, a little bit later in this presentation. But that's uh, in a nutshell how you would split up your data for training and testing. Now, from there, you build a model uh, based only on training data and that generates in sample results. So that allows us to uh, see if there's any useful patterns being picked up by the data, by the modeling technique by Tim uh, and compare those to in sample uh, training data. And from there, we generate predictions. So we combine the model uh, and make predictions in the latter part of the data set. So we can compare that to values it has never seen before. Um, and 
see how team would perform in a real uh, production scenario. Now, from there, you would typically calculate uh, a lot of different KPIs and, and accuracy metrics to uh, put a number on this. Here we see, uh, for example, the mean absolute error visualized. Um, and then you have an answer about the quality of the predictions. So that's, in a sense, the, the process that you go through. Now, how to do this correctly? How, what are the questions that you need to ask yourself so that you um, get the results uh, in the proper way and that the results are indeed what you're looking for? Um, and then you can uh, make sure that whatever you put into a production context it'll, uh, will be um, of good quality. Well, very important uh, point here is that you first need to properly understand the use case. There's no use of simply sending data through a modeling technique and letting it generate results without thinking about the setup. Um, it's very important to um, describe what is the objective of the use case, what is the question that you want answered, um, because that way you will be able to uh, tweak and uh, tune any modeling technique properly so that um, you get your quality results. So first, make sure that you have a good description of the use case. Second uh, important topic is uh, understanding the data well. So before doing any backtesting, it's uh, very always very useful to explore the data in detail, take a closer look at what patterns there might be that you can detect visually that you want um, Tim to automatically extract from the data. Um, and uh, if that then happens, uh, you can confirm that indeed the modeling technique worked well. Um, another very important thing uh, about the data is that you understand how it's aligned. That's actually a topic of another video that, uh, that we have uh, about data availability at the moment of execution, because you don't want to have uh, data leakage. I will go uh, into more detail about what that is uh, later, but you need to make sure that you provide the model the data that it has at the moment of execution and not too much information which will skew the results. Um, and then also take a look at the historical data, see what um, if there's any structural changes, gaps in the data, or, um, or may, data might be irrelevant uh, or unavailable now, which was available in the past. Um, so all of those things are uh, things to consider. And then a uh, third point is to simulate a production scenario as closely as possible, because there's different levels to uh, backtesting. You can do a high level backtest, take a quick look at the predictive value in a data set. But the best way to answer um, your question is to get as close to a production scenario as possible. So that means that you describe your setup as well properly, like what are your forecasting horizons? Um, what is your rolling window? And I will go deeper into what that means. Um, in, in the next set of slides, but getting as close to a production scenario as possible while backtesting will give you a more clear answer on the quality of your predictions. And then lastly, make sure to choose relevant KPIs. So there are a couple of KPIs that we, uh, with Tim, provide you automatically. We'll go deeper into those uh, in the next set as well. Um, but in a lot of time series use cases, um, it's going to be necessary to calculate specific uh, KPIs, your specific su success criteria for the case. So you need to, before working on a backtesting scenario, define clearly what you consider a successful uh, prediction so that you can guide the modeling technique to that point rather than um, simply um, see what a modeling technique can do and then uh, don't start working in circles. So make sure that you have a clear KPI in mind that you want to uh, calculate. So let's see that in action. Um, imagine that we have these data sets that we want to do uh, a back test on. That means that we're now at the end of the data sets. That's our current uh, point of view. This everything before that line is the data that we have available. So if you now want to do um, a backtesting scenario, we need to set the point somewhere in the past, which is our point of view. Uh, so we're going to assume that the data that we have here in the in the light blue box, uh, that's the only data that we have available. Everything on the right of the point of view um, is not yet available. We cannot use that in the model building. That's um, information that we're only going to use to validate the uh, predictions. Now, that means that we have here a whole period of uh, predictions that we can make. Now, an important distinction needs to be made between 
the uh, periods in which you're going to do the backtest and your forecasting horizon. But those are going to be two different uh, two different ideas. A forecasting horizon is really the values that you're going to generate. For example, here I'm going to generate a seven day ahead forecast, um, but I'm going to do this exercise throughout the period uh, that's indicated in the in dark blue. There's a 14 day period in which I'm going to do this exercise. Um, and I'm going to do this with a rolling window of one day. So what does that mean? I'm going to execute this exercise uh, every day and it's going to shift forward uh, through time. And now here again, an important distinction needs to be made between the testing period and the forecasting horizon um, because it will uh, we won't be creating, let's say, a 14 day ahead forecast in this case. We will create a seven day ahead forecast which will shift forward and that will replicate uh, a real scenario where we, uh, in the production scenario, forecast seven days uh, ahead, which is what the example that I'm showing here. So what does it look like? Point of view shifts, the forecasting horizon shifts, and it moves through the horizon uh, like that. Uh, and then continues on throughout this testing period. And that generates uh, a whole set of values for us to analyze. So what uh, does it then look like? Well, if we take a look at these tables, that will uh, give us a visual on the values that we generate. So for example, on the 5th of October here uh, in uh, blue on the top left, we see that we generate a seven day ahead forecast for the dates that are indicated in green for the timestamps uh, on top. And the next day we repeat that exercise, so we shift one day forward. And then uh, the 7th of October, we repeat that exercise again. And that means that we, for each um, exercise here, create values of a D plus one quality, D plus two quality, and so on until D plus seven. Now it's important to make that distinction between the qualities of these uh, samples ahead, because looking further ahead is of course a lot harder than looking closely ahead, because there's a, a lot more uncertainty the further you look ahead. Uh, so it's going to be useful to distinguish between those points and not simply calculate an accuracy over the overall forecasting horizon, but rather distinct, make a distinction between each uh, sample ahead um, because in your process you might not want to use the entirety of your forecasting horizon. You might want to use, for example, a specific uh, date ahead, but um, you have the other values there as information to anticipate uh, changes that might be indicated by uh, the forecast. So we take, for example, the D plus ones, we put those together on a single line or the D plus twos or the D plus threes, and we continue the rest of our uh, process using that information. Now you can imagine uh, a scenario where this could be useful. Let's say in supply chain where you are, um, where you have a process where a certain lead time of four days occurs, for example. Uh, so you order a product and it, you need to wait four days uh, before it can um, it can refill your stock, your inventory, for example. Well, in that case, you need to anticipate the demand four days ahead, and we'll only be using that set of values. Um, but you still want to have the information of the seven day ahead forecast um, to um, improve your process upon, but we'll focus the process on that D plus four. That's an example of how that uh, could be used, but understanding that there's um, data points in your forecasting horizon of different qualities, and you might want to use specific ones. Um, that's an important thing to keep in mind while backtesting. And it all depends on the reaction time that you have in your process. So in the example that I just given, reaction time was four days. So there we need to at least start using those values. So how does that then look like um, from a data point of view? Well, what you typically would get is a table with um, these uh, things really on the right, where you have a date from column, which indicates the perspective, the point of view from which you are forecasting. A second thing is the time stamp column, which are connected to the uh, the values. So the timestamps um, uh, will have each target value while you're backtesting. You have those values available in a forecasting a production scenario. Of course, you don't have those sets available yet. And those are then, um, you then generate your forecasts, your predictions, uh, which you can now put next to your target values. And on top of that, uh, in order to get an answer to the quality of these predictions, you calculate a whole uh, bunch of accuracy metrics. So the ones that we provide automatically here 
are here indicated um, on the left. So we have the mean absolute error, uh, the mean absolute percentage error, and the root mean square error. So all of those um, have their advantages and disadvantages disadvantages in different scenarios, um, but we see that these are most used in uh, time series analysis. So that's why we provide them to you automatically. Um, but for example, the, the mean absolute percentage error, that's uh, most intuitive one, it gives you a percentage uh, difference between your target and your forecast uh, in absolute values, and that allows you to get uh, an intuitive answer to the quality of your predictions. Um, and now important to to know is that you can filter out um, either on date from, on timestamp, on relative distance, um, the uh, results that you need. So for example, if you need all the D plus four ahead forecast, you simply filter on that column and then you get an answer on the quality of the predictions that you will actually use in your processes. If you want to see what predictions uh, on a certain timestamp, uh, what the quality on a certain date was, well, um, maybe there was a difficult date to forecast, maybe something interesting happened at that date, but well, you want to focus on that, then you filter on such a column. Maybe you want to take a look at a specific time where the forecast was executed. Uh, maybe on the 6th of October, uh, something happened. Maybe there was a, a system down where data uh, unavailability was caused. Well, then you want to see if that had an impact on your predictions and then you filter on that. And that offers different perspectives on the quality of your predictions and having that um, those insights available can be invaluable uh, while backtesting. So make sure to uh, familiarize yourself with, uh, with those values. Now, there's a couple of things that you need to keep in mind um, and avoid certainly while backtesting, uh, because the results that you generate, um, you need to make sure that those indeed uh, are useful. And the first big one, which I already mentioned, is uh, data leakage. Now, data leakage, it means that you're providing the model with information it shouldn't have available at the moment of forecasting. So how should you um, visualize this? Well, while you're backtesting, you do have information available um, throughout your entire out of sample period. But you want to make sure that while you're creating the predictions, that it's not using information which it shouldn't have uh, at that moment. Um, for example, I'm in a financial trading context and I have tomorrow's price and I want to make sure that I can accurately um, predict that price. I need to make sure that my predictor candidates, my extra variables which will assist me in that uh, process are not um, uh, already updated, let's say ahead of time, uh, but are uh, from the point of view of which we are forecasting uh, available. If not, we're going to have information there that will shift the way that we trade, and that's not going to be a representative image um, of the in the backtest. And you might get some different ideas on the performance of your of your model. So make sure to avoid uh, data leakage. Another thing is understanding how to use the different KPIs. So the ones that we provide here are some. Uh, the main pros and cons of using each individual um, KPI. First of all, the main, it's easy to calculate. It will always be calculable. It's a simple uh, absolute difference between your target and your forecast. So you can uh, always count on that one. M makes it a, a big advantage. Um, however, it's relative to the target. So if you have high values and low values within your data set, then uh, that might give you a skewed image uh, throughout your entire data set of the, the quality. So you need to keep in mind that uh, it's very dependent on the values of the target itself. Um, the mean absolute percentage error, the MAPI, um, that there are big pros that it's intuitive. It's a percentage. You can say that I'm 98% accurate, for example, in my predictions, which is easily understandable and can be shared across uh, with many colleagues, colleagues rather easily. However, a big um, con is that it cannot be calculated whenever your target value is zero, and it's also very uh, difficult when it gets close to zero because then you get uh, MAPI values which are simply um, illogical. Um, so make sure to keep that in mind while you're using that uh, KPI. And then lastly, the root mean square error. Well, um, a big pro is that that works well with outliers. It's also uh, very often used in the data science community. Um, so there you can easily compare uh, models next to one another. 
Um, however, a big uh, con is that it's not very intuitive. Um, you cannot say that a MAPI uh, or an uh, RMSC of 5000 is good or one of 200. It's uh, always very uh, use case specific. So keep those things in mind while uh, using different KPIs and uh, it's always best to learn how to use them and very the best way to do that is to visualize them and see if you can get um, interesting visuals by comparing your actuals and your predictions. And then lastly, one big thing to keep in mind is uh, which historical values um, you should include um, while doing the backtesting. Um, there's a couple of ways to select uh, the historical values for your both your training and your testing. You want to get a representative image of a production scenario. So um, you, might, you might have a data set, let's say, with three years worth of data. Do you now simply split it up into two years for training, one year of testing, or do you split it up into two uh, years and 11 months and one month of testing? Because that give, might give a more representative image of, of the current situation. You might want to include the latest information in your model building so that you can capture a real signal. Uh, because in time series data, uh, it's very easy to overfit on old and irrelevant data. And you might want to cut off uh, earlier data um, in the process. And then lastly, uh, selecting a sensible forecasting horizon is also going to be very important. I will show you that, uh, what that looks like in the studio, um, because while backtesting, there might be some um, confusion there. So let's quickly take a look at the studio. We have this example ready to finish off. Um, where we're going to forecast the electricity consumption in Belgium, and we're going to use this data set. So the target value that we want to predict, we see visualized here, it's called quantity. And we're going to use a whole bunch of uh, other columns, such as weather variables and uh, calendar information to uh, make an accurate model. So if we now want to perform a backtest, we have a couple of tools at our disposal to do that here in the studio. First of all, very important, the forecasting horizon. Um, in this example, I will do a simple um, model where I look 24 samples ahead in these hourly data beats we're going to forecast the next day. Then there is uh, a selection that you can make on the uh, in and out of sample data. So by default, the studio will uh, split up your data into two thirds or and one third for uh, testing. However, you can select which parts to include. So if you, for example, want to uh, use less for uh, testing, well, then you can see you can move the slider across and select the regions that you're most interested in. You can also um, cut off older data rather easily because you might want to focus on the latest, uh, as I mentioned earlier. So that allows you to easily um, make those selections. There's also an easy way to um, select different periods based on the, uh, the dates and the time itself. Um, and you can also cut out specific parts um, that you might want to avoid including in the in the model building process because of dirty data, because of gaps, etc. So let's assume that this is the selection that we want to make. We want to make a 24 hour ahead forecast. Now there's one more thing that we can set and that's the rolling window. And that tells us uh, in a sense how often we want to make a prediction within the uh, out of sample period. So by default, it will be set to zero, which means that it will take the um, length of the forecasting horizon, so 24, which means that it will shift day by day, generating 24 hour ahead forecast throughout the out of sample uh, range. Now, one important thing to keep in mind here is um, the forecasting horizon, as I mentioned before, is 24 here. So we have here our out of sample period, which is um, longer than um, the in sample, uh, longer, of course, than the forecasting horizon. However, um, we will then do within that forecasting horizon multiple 24-hour um, head forecasts. And then I can simply hit the button and send the requests like this to uh, our API. And you see now that the model is being built. Uh, it's doing for us fully automatically the feature engineering and the model building, extracting the information from um, the data set and uh, generating our backtesting results uh, in the process fully automatically. So we'll give that a couple of seconds more to, um, to calculate and then we have our answer ready. 
So a couple of things show up on screen. Let's focus on the graph here and take a closer look. Of course, in red, that's our in-sample um, results. So we based the model only on the uh, first part of the data, and that generated these red results. And then we tried out this model um, in the yellow part, and that generated the yellow prediction. So if you take a closer look at that, we see that the um, that the yellow predictions and both red predictions seem to have picked up on uh, the pattern that's within the data. The um, blue values and our predicted values are seem to be closely aligned. So that's already a visual uh, indication that uh, our model seems to perform well. And now we can um, now we have uh, in a sense an answer on the question: How accurate are my predictions? Uh, we also provide that, of course, in a set of numbers. Um, so in the boxes here at the bottom left, you can see in and out of sample results where you calculate the difference between the red and the blue and the yellow and the blue in and out of sample. So for example, here we have a MAPI of 2.4%, uh, which means that on average we're off by 2.4%. And now we can compare that to a benchmark that we might have available and, um, and uh, start experimenting from there to see if we can improve the results or if we're happy with the accuracy uh, put this into a production scenario and start creating uh, production scenario results and how would that then look like well if we want to do a production scenario um, we simply include not um, we don't cut off the data into training and testing we simply do the same exercise only we now include everything in the in sample and we uh, don't select an out of sample period and that will generate for us a production uh, forecast. So I'm sending a new request to the engine now. It's building a completely new model. Um, it will, of course, be very similar to the one that we just built. However, it will now include the entire data set all the way to the end. And then we will uh, have our uh, forecast values uh, readily available, which hopefully will be comparable to the backtesting results that we had uh, earlier in the previous experiment. So those results are now coming up. We see that the entire uh, data set is now uh, covered with in-sample uh, results. And if we zoom in all the way to the end, we have our forecasted values uh, ready for inspection. So hopefully uh, when the new values become available the next day, we can uh, calculate an accuracy which is comparable to the uh, backtested results that we uh, had earlier to confirm that the backtesting indeed uh, is a representative image of um, the quality of our model. And that's in a nutshell um, things to keep in mind while backtesting and how you can easily leverage Tim's time series capabilities and backtesting functionalities to uh, get your answers rather quickly. Uh, so I will uh, close off here. And um, thank you for joining us in this session. We're having a couple of more time series session, sessions after this. So we hope to uh, see you there and that you can learn some more about them and our time series uh, capabilities. Thanks a lot and uh, see you in the next time.